The Armouth Jail took five years off the end of all of our lives. Not because of ghosts and demons, although maybe, but because it's an environmental hazard. And we didn't know that going in. It didn't have running water, it didn't have heat, didn't have lights, didn't have power. Um, I actually thought it had been turned into a community center because I read a CBC News article from three years ago when the current owners bought the old jail. It's a decommissioned jail. And the article said, we're going to turn it into a community center. Idiot that I am, I just kind of assumed that they had done that. Turns out, no, because it would cost $2 million to fix this disastrous mess. Um, so this is the old county jail, stems back to the 1800s. Paint peeling from the walls. I'm pretty sure there's asbestos in there. Um, there's thalidomide, I don't know what else they have in there. There's rats, there are rats in the basement. So I went down into the basement, the lights are all off, and we had a, a CCTV pointing down the stairs into the basement. The rest of my crew knew about this. They could see the rats, like their little beady eyes, and running and up to the camera, and then, who is the rat gonna go into Paul, or is the rat gonna go back over there? Oh, he's going back, oh, he's going into Paul. Never once did they think to call me and say, you're in a dark basement infested with rats. So occasionally, ghost jerk that I am, the crew would find ways to get back at me. Uh, that was one of them. But the Yarmouth Jail was a really creepy thing. Uh, the main stories in the jail were on the, there's three floors. First floor was where they kept the male prisoners. Second floor, they kept the female prisoners. Third floor is an attic where the last hanging in Yarmouth County took place. A guy who murdered, um, older guy, I think his name was Omar, Omar Roberts. You can read this, uh, the Chronicle Herald, all the newspapers at the time reported on this. In 1922, brutally murdered a young girl who was potentially his girlfriend. He was in his 60s, she was in his er, 20s, um, by burning her alive. Doused her in fuel oil and literally burned her alive. So he was convicted and hanged upstairs. The gallows that they built, the stairs still go up. You can still see the trap door in the floor where he would have gone down through. On the first floor, a prisoner had killed himself by slicing his throat up. Um, so he'd almost half decapitated himself. So a lot of bad juju in this place. And in the basement, we called it the torture room because in the basement, it's where they would often take prisoners back in the days when the police would still do this uh, to rough them up a bit. So, you know, you've got a still or you're involved in rum running in the 1920s or whatever. You know, who are your accomplices? Smack, smack, smack. You know, where's your still or whatever? Smack, smack, smack. Where does Al Capone keep his money? Whatever. Um, so three different places that, like, if you believe in negative energy, this is a place that was full of negative energy, as well as asbestos falling from the ceiling. So, cool. Um, this next clip, next slide, place is even freakier at night, by the way. Dylan, we arrived there a day early. <laughs> Dylan and I went down to take a look at the place, and we just stood outside at night and went, holy, and a word that rhymes with truck. Like, wow, this is the scariest looking place, and we thought, cool, wow, this is awesome until they opened it up the next day and we realized no heat, no running water, no bathrooms. The Wendy's down the road got to know us really well for the 14 hours we were shooting. You guys are back again? Yes, washroom over here. Um, and do you have the heat on? Because it was really cold. So this clip, I'll just play it. What was that? I absolutely just heard something. So that sound came from above her, and she was recording that. <clears throat> she was walking through on her own accord. That is recorded on her cell phone camera, which wonderful things we didn't have nine years ago as tools that we could use for filming stuff. She's just walking through with her cell phone recording that, and she picked it up clear as day. Now, d turns out, what's directly above her? Well, that's where they hanged Omar Roberts. So she hears what sounds like thump, 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 and so she goes up to investigate it. Next slide, I guess. Um, oh, I guess I gotta finish the story because this is a different sort of occurrence. And when she gets up there, we run a little test. So I stay upstairs, she goes back down to where she was, and I walk up the gallows, which I wasn't keen on doing uh, for a whole heck of a lot of reasons. Bad juju again. And as soon as I go, she goes, downstairs, I can hear her. She's like, that's, that's what I just heard. And the sound sounds exactly like what she heard. Now, is that the ghost of Omar Roberts walking up the gallows? I don't know. All I know is that whatever we might have been dealing with, she heard it, it's recorded, and it happened above her where there should have been no sound coming from up there. Um, next slide. 
I'm trying to remember what happened in this one. Probably something bad that I did. Yeah, there's just something about that one. For me. It's like I walk in right. there and I think I'm never coming out again. I'll take the hit on this one then, because um, that interests me. You usually don't get apprehensive, uh, pretty level-headed. I've found in the past that when you do get apprehensive, it usually means that there might actually be something to it. So I'm going to trust your instincts, and I'll do a little bit of a sit-down in here and see if I can uh, say hello to whatever might be in here, if there is anything in here. OK, can you pause for a second, Greg? It's, see, it says narration because when we finish this episode, I'll be putting the, something along the lines of the following. I'm a bad person. So Holly felt really weirded out. This is the cell on the second floor that was right next to where she had been when she had heard the sound upstairs. It really freaked her out. She felt very, you know, sort of like apprehensive when she went into the cell. She called me up. And I said, and you can see I'm wearing gloves by now. We went out and bought gloves at the Walmart because the place was an environmental disaster zone. And uh, I said, I'll take the hit, Holly. I will go in this cell. You don't have to. I will do the ghost contacty kind of thing. Noble, right? Well, funny thing. So I go in the cell, and I sit down. You see me there. And I kind of got bored. And nine years ago, remember when I told you when my skepticism faded that I was strangled by a ghost in a jail cell? Well, Holly was in that cell with me nine years ago. It was a jail cell in St. Andrews, Nova, uh, New Brunswick. It was where the last hanging in New Brunswick took place in the 1940s. An RAF serviceman had brutally murdered a local girl, convicted during the war, and he was hanged there. We went into his cell. They were building, it's kind of the makeshift thing they do in the Maritimes. They built his gallows literally outside the, uh, the cell that he was in, and they hanged him there. We go in the cell, sat down, closed the door, they locked us in, and in the space of about 20 minutes, I felt like I was being strangled by cold twice. Holly saw a shadow, you know, darker than dark, as she described it, go past her, and our EMF meters went crazy, all kind of at the same time. The guy's name was Sergeant Tom Hutchings. We tend not to talk about Sergeant Hutchings, Holly and I, even nine years later. It's, it's one of those, like, here's the list of 10 things that have happened to us that we, Holly's never happy when I bring up. So I go in here, and after getting bored for about 15 minutes, I go, you know, Sergeant Hutchings, if you're out there in the ether, you and I have unfinished business. If you're out there, you make yourself known right now. Bring it on. Now, Holly's not there, so she can't hear me do this. And remember, while I would never fake anything, I am making a television show, and this is good television, you know, if I'm going to call out Sergeant Hutchings. I, I have to say, I didn't really think about the potential consequences of doing this. It was like when I called out the ghost Nazis or the demons or whatever else I'm calling out. I just didn't think it through. So, Greg, continuing on. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to go off the grid of smart things and back onto the grid of dumb things that I've been known to do. Let's put that on the floor. If out in the ether somewhere the spirit of Tom Hutchings is there. The Tom Hutchings that I may have run into in February 2009 in the St. Andrews jail cell. Sergeant Hutchings, if you are out there Come say hello, because I think you and I have unfinished business. What was that? Hey, Chelsea, did you hear something upstairs? Yeah, I'm listening to Paul, and it 
through his audio, I can hear, I could hear something from upstairs. It was, and we checked this, we went through and moved every door in every jail cell. It was a jail cell door moving. There's no question, you can hear it. It's not super loud because it's not happening in the hallway I'm in. We figured out it was happening in the hallway in the next sort of, the building went like this. Hallway, middle, you know, where there's nothing really, and then another row of cells over there, and it was happening over there. Uh, we went over, took a look, and we found that one of the jail cell doors had moved, that it was actually now closed instead of, um, sorry, open instead of being closed. What we all heard, and again, different people here experiencing the same thing at the same time. I'm in the cell 20, 25 seconds after I call out Tom Hutchings, thum, 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 which is the sound that the jail cell door, this particular jail cell door, makes. Holly, Chelsea's got the sound gear on, so she hears what I'm hearing in my cell because it's coming through my microphone into her headphones. So that's perfectly legit and normal. But Holly was way out in the front hallway with Dylan, I think Dylan was there, um, certainly my brother was there where the monitor was set up as well as the owner of the building. And this is important too, we can account for where everybody in the building was. They heard it as well, not through my microphone, but themselves, which is why Holly walks in, which she normally would not do because you know that while I'm doing a segment, you stay away when somebody's filming. So I'm in there, Holly's working, or sorry, Chelsea's working doing sound, but this sound seemed so anomalous to them that Holly broke protocol and decided to go talk to Chelsea, which is why they're whispering. And she said, did you hear anything? Because I'm around the corner. And, uh, and Chelsea goes, yes, I heard it through my headphones. And Paul just said, he heard something too. And Holly's like, well, that's weird because we heard it too. I didn't include the rest of this clip because it doesn't end well for me. Holly, not happy when she found out I was calling down Tom Hutchings. So, you know, I don't want to make myself look complete. I, she really laid into me. There's a point where I go, I know that look. Um, that, that's not a good look, Holly. Uh, should we go investigate that together? Yes, let's. And then we, because she was not going alone. But let's see if we can hear the sound uh, one more time, just so you know it's there. If out in the ether somewhere, the spirit of Tom Hutchings is there. And it comes a little later. I can tell you as the I'm Tom doing Hutchings this, that I may have run into. I know it's a bad idea. In February 2009 in the St. Andrews jail cell. Because I'm looking down going, this is dumb, this is dumb. Sergeant Hutchings, if you are out there, come say hello. Oh, that was because stupid. I think you and I have unfinished business. That was stupid. That's it. Was Greg, that? Greg has the mic much closer to the speaker now. That is a jail cell hey Chelsea, did you on the other side of the building. Upstairs? And it's exactly what they heard too, sitting out in the lobby. And when we went to take a look at the door, the door had been moved. Now, remember, I said there are rats in this building. The rats are in the basement. But even if one of the little devils had crawled up to the second floor of the building, that's sort of a Sharknado-sized rat. Like, that's a sci-fi special. If I had a picture of a rat that big that could move those heavy jail cell doors, which um, you could see in that clip, these things are giant, huge sort of metal doors, I could make a lot more money showing that clip around than I could from ghost hunting. That rat doesn't exist. So that door moved on its own, we heard it, and we also managed to record the audio. All cool. Even cooler to me is when you can link that as almost a call response kind of thing. Me calling out Tom Hutchings, saying come down and give us a sign, and then something happens 25 seconds later. Bunch of moving parts to that. Those are the things that make me go, hmm. Now. Before we go to the next slide, so the Yarmouth Jail. Remember I told you the basement, we called it the torture basement. I went down into the basement. Now remember, I just said I'm a jerk. But every now and then, and this happened after, I kind of thought, I've, that's dumb. Tom Hutchings, what am I doing? So I thought, I'm going to try and be nice. Dylan, you agree that I was at least trying to be nice? Yeah, see? 
So I went down and I said, you know what? Normally I'd do something like boom, boom, boom. And I'd pretend torture the ghost to try and get a response. And it's true, I may have done that. But after that was over, I said, you know what? No, this, this, isn't, this isn't the way I want to go. I want to be nicer. Cold is my thing. And I'd noticed that the temperature had been, had been uh, steady at 12.8 until I went in there. And then it had gone down a little to about 12.4. Now, I don't consider that statistically um, significant. If it continues to go down, there's a point usually at about a 10 to 15% decrease that I do start to consider it statistically significant. So I took a different tack. I started to say, if there is some spirit down in this torture dungeon, perhaps you were wrongfully accused that they're down here beating the living hell out of you and you didn't actually do what they think you did. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to tell me your side of the story and here's how I want you to do it. I want you to continue to take the temperature down. This is our call response. If you can get the temperature down below 10 degrees, and remember we started at 12.8, then get it to 9.9, .9, not only do I consider that a statistically significant drop in a room where the temperature had not been dropping, but I say, you will be free to go. This is me telling you that this will convince me that you did not commit whatever crime you're supposedly being tortured in here for or whatever. Again, I tried to be nice. So, funny thing, the temperature starts dropping and I continue on and then I call Holly um, and Dylan and Chelsea bring the camera down, something weird is happening down here. And so they come down and they film this and Holly, the video's not here, but it's really, Holly's got this look on her face like this. And it's sort of half said, this isn't the Paul I know. And what's your end game? There has to be a punchline here. You're gonna go rogue in a second. Nope, nope, totally not. So anyway, the temperature in a space of less than 10 minutes drops down below 10 degrees. Not only statistically significant to me, but really quick. And as I'm doing this, like just taking another, you know, 0.1 degree, bring it down. You have almost convinced us. We are feeling, you know, like this whole conversation. Boom, 9.9. .9. You are free to go, sir. Your spirit is wrongfully accused. You are free to go. And Holly looks at me and she says, wow. And I go, yeah, I, 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 I feel good. And she says, you, you did something nice. You did something good. And I went, I did. and she said, how did it feel? And I went, weird, but, but good. And we both walked out of the basement. And, you know, she didn't forgive me for the Tom Hutchings thing, but, you know, I was sort of, I went from 10 on the um, she hates me scale to like seven. And I thought, nice. Maybe this is a new tactic that I should take. Well, Here's the thing, no good deed goes unpunished. Next slide. Dylan sends me a screen capture, um, and this is like, we have what, Dylan? 1,500 clips and audio sources, three, no, audio. Right, 1,500 video clips and probably 1,500 audio clips. Poor Dylan has to go through, log them all, put new names on them so that we can access them in the editing. He took this screen capture here of his computer as he was doing it on the Yarmouth Jail episode. That's the clip number. These are the names that Dylan gave them to make it easier for me when I'm editing so I can go, oh, this is Paul talking to Tom Hutchings. This is whatever. Um, Holly saying hello to a cat as opposed to, you know, a string of numbers, which I wouldn't recognize. So he has to go through, hand, round of applause, because this takes him hours and hours and hours to do. He gets to this one, and it says, Paul releases spirit from torture room, trying to be a nice guy. These are the file size of all of the clips. So this one is 3.72 gigabytes. That's 2.7 gigabytes. That is 6.66 gigabytes of data. We couldn't fake that if we tried. So he immediately blue highlights this, sends me a Facebook message, something along the lines of, you bastard, even when you try and be a good guy, you've released Satan. So apparently I make a very bad police officer too. Uh, I misjudge my suspect. But that to me, not only, I know you're all laughing, but funny thing. I should almost bring Dylan up to tell this story, but um, he might say things about me that I wouldn't appreciate. So worse, uh, Barrington is about 40 minutes roughly from Yarmouth, right? 
So we stay in Yarmouth because there's really no place to stay in Barrington. It's a very small community. So we get this old sea captain's house in Yarmouth. Big, big mansion. Rooms for everyone. Everyone gets their own room. It's huge, huge, lovely house. So Dylan, in Dylan's room, he, uh, we called it the blue room. I didn't know about this until later. He, is it fair to say that when you were in the room, Dylan, you looked up because from your bed you could see the bathroom window, or sorry, the, the screen on the bathroom shower, and past that, come on up. I want you to describe this. Now, before he describes this, remember, we didn't hear about this until we went back because we stayed in the same house a couple weeks later when we went down to film the military museum and, um, and Seaside. So uh, the first time when we were filming the Yarmouth Jail, we stayed in this place. Now, to set this up, Holly's room is right across from Dylan's. And to prove that I'm not the only jerk on the ghost hunting uh, co-hosting team, Holly, while in her room, which we call the cheetah room, because for some inexplicable reason, over the bed, there's a giant picture of a cheetah, which <laughs> makes no sense. I mean, a tuna maybe, but a cheetah totally doesn't make any sense. Um, Holly, while lying in bed, felt as if like there was this blacker than black shape in front of her. And she felt very weirded out by it, like, oh. So Holly decided, she calls it a quality control check. She said, well, if there's anything here, I don't know if I can trust my senses. If you're here, go over to Dylan's room and, uh, and show yourself to Dylan. And then if Dylan sees whatever you are, then we'll have, we'll have independent multiple co corroboration. Now that's good science, it's bad friendship. Um, so anyway, I, anyway, Dylan, take it, take it away. I love this story. I mean, I hate it, but I love it. I hate you. <laughs> so imagine, uh, basically the way that my bed was set up is that I could, uh, when I'm laying down, I could see into the bathroom of my room and they had a stand-up shower that had, uh, you know, just a pane of glass. There was no curtain, there was just glass. So the first night we were there, fine. I slept like a baby, no problems at all. After this happens, I feel uneasy in that room for some reason. I don't know why. I have no idea why. I can't explain it. And so I'm looking. It's about 2 a.m., probably 3 a.m. because we were shooting late. And I look over there because something red catches my eye. I'm like, what is that? That wasn't there last night. I'm looking over, and then I'm seeing kind of looks like the shape of a face. I'm like, that's interesting. And above the face was... Um, I guess what I would describe as two horns. See where I'm going with this already. Uh, and the, the face structure almost looked like a deer skull with horns, with two red, dark red, almost maroon eyes staring at me the whole night. And every time I looked back, it was still there. I was like, that's creepy as hell. I didn't sleep that night at all. I, I, I don't think I slept any at all at that house from that point on. Best thing is that then we found out that it was the exact same night and the exact same time that Holly had decided to test quality with me. Um, and I never saw it after that. And after we filmed that episode where I was trying to be a good guy, but 666 might have left the basement instead. And can, yeah, just for reference too, 1,500 video files just on our main camera. We also have... Uh, up to 16 different angles on our CCTVs every night. We have every bit of audio. We have GoPro footage. We have a lot of files. We have four hard drives full. That is our only 6.66 .66 file out of all of them. So. Yeah, no, he signed on to do the second season. Um, I'm sort of running out of time and I want to open up for questions, but I want you to know that jerks like me always get our comeuppance. At the end of the day, um, I'm not really a jerk, by the way, but uh, I just play one on television. When you do stuff like this, when you screw around with people like Dylan, when you send things out, when you try and go ghost rogue, as I like to call it, channeling my inner Sarah Palin, um, and who would have thought that Sarah Palin was the second worst option for president? Anyway, um, <laughs> funny thing. So uh, next slide. Th this is Paul and Holly getting their comeuppance. This is the Cumberland County Museum. It is the most frightening place I've ever been to. It's in Amherst, Nova Scotia. It's a nice museum, actually. 
Um, it's an old house from a guy who knew Charles Tupper, involved in the Fathers of Confederation, and all that sort of stuff. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, okay. So much happened in this house that, you know, it's kind of distilled into small little segments here. This is us. We, we call this um, the vortex room because early in the evening, I'm a dumbass. I may have tried to open a vortex. I mean, I don't even really know what I'm doing, but it was like if, you know, if there's a vortex, people have said there might be vortexes here, open one up. True, right. They had brought a psychic in to purposefully close the vortex. And anyway, um, whoops. So I, we're up there, you know, just, anyway, we're just chatting. Greg, play the crypt. Uh, play the crypt, sorry. Oh, by the way, there's, uh, we use little audio recorders. So do Linda and Kelly and everything to try and pick up, you know, ghostly sounds or whatever, interacting with us. You know, if you're out there, give us a sign. Hello. And so there was one sitting on a chair and had been sitting there for three hours, undisturbed, in the middle of this room. I will vouch on my uh, on a Bible or my grave or whatever that none of us, as we do what we're about to do, touch that chair in any way. Here we go. Oh, gosh. What was that? Did somebody bump something? The, the thing just like flew off. Are you kidding me? You didn't hit that. Nope. You didn't touch that? Nope. Okay. Yes, and to, to touch it, you'd have to push it back. Was the Where chair? was it? It was right here. It was sitting here. You'd have to push it backwards. Like you'd have to kick the chair as you're walking by it behind you. And no, I didn't touch the chair. Yeah, it doesn't even roll. We would have heard that. You had kicked it. That, the only thing that moved right there was the recorder itself. The recorder went flying off the chair as we exited the room after we've been talking about vortexes and some of the weird things that have been happening to us. Um, other things that happened to us, and if you have a chance, if you're ever driving through um, uh, Amherst, um, go to the Cumberland County Museum, see if they'll let you into the archives room. Multiple times we put pictures out and would lock the door behind us. Nobody could get into that room. We would come back, the pictures would be moved. One time off a chair onto a floor, two other times we put them up on a counter, or sorry, a shelf, and they would move on the shelf. Not off, but move into different positions. Um, Dylan, there's a whole thing that we, other trigger objects that we used. But here, here's my favorite. The next two clips, and then I'll wrap her up here. Remember, you get your comeuppance, or the love you take is equal to the demon you make. So, this is the basement of the Cumberland County Museum reports of people feeling uneasy and all sorts of stuff down there. So I go down and I sit on the total darkness, total darkness. I sit on the stairs earlier and I'm just like thinking to myself, wow, this is the last episode we're gonna film. Turns out we did do one more, but I thought this was the last one at the time. And it has been a weird night tonight. I mean, I, I joke when I say this, but I don't have kids. Dylan is sort of my, my protege. He might not like it, but Jedi Master, Jedi Knight. He will someday be a greater Jedi Knight than I ever am. But he's sort of like a son to me. And I, I had chewed him out that evening in a way that, like it took us about two weeks afterwards to kind of hash it out, because neither one of us wanted to talk about it. There's no real good, we kind of had a little tiff over what shot to use, penny ante stuff. But I was so out of sorts in this building, so angry for no reason that I just let him have it. And later in the night, I just kind of went off on a rant. So here I am sitting in the basement, total negative energy kind of being channeled through me on this entire episode. And so here's what happened. Sit, I'm looking at a black wall and then blacker than black with two red dots. I didn't see horns, but I saw what looked to be like a face with two red dots. So I call Holly down, and she's in this, this is a screen capture of the footage. I call Holly down, because the only way you can see this is if we freeze the frame. And Holly sits with me, I just do not want to be in the basement anymore. And I kind of felt bad about the Dylan thing even then. And so she and I were just talking, and I told her, look, here's what I saw. And I said, it almost, to me, it kind of looked like what that thing that Dylan saw. Do you think maybe I'm channeling some of Dylan's angst into me because of what we're doing? I don't know. So we're talking like that, and then we get, was it you that called us or Chelsea? Dylan calls down, because they're 
up the stairs, doors closed, they're in the kitchen out there, but they're on the monitor. They're looking at the closed circuit camera television that is filming us right here. And they, Dylan says, uh, can you guys come up here? I wanna show you something. Well, I don't wanna leave the basement because um, you know, continuity of shooting and stuff like that. So I, you know, Holly, go up and see what he wants. Holly goes up, Dylan has freeze framed this and shown it to her. She wasn't happy when she came back down. Now, it doesn't seem this way, but Dylan and I are professionals. This is what we do, filmmaking for a career. Cameras are our lives. Both of us sat there for 20 minutes afterwards and said, went through the footage, slowed it down, everything. This, you should not be getting light refraction like this. We compared similar frames where I would flash the light up and nothing like this. This is me flashing the light up, uh, trying to show Holly the spot on the wall where I'd seen the head and the two little eyes. That light refraction is why Dylan called her up. We closed the investigation down after we spent like trying to figure it out. I wouldn't go back in the basement. Um, I know what I saw on that wall. I know how I felt that entire night. And when they showed me this, I just went, I've never seen a light refraction like that. Dylan hasn't, and we've seen thousands of them uh, during the shoot in other ways. So the love you make, the demons you take. And yet, that's not the worst of it. Next slide, please, because I think I get a scoot. Uh, next slide, that's Ottawa House in Parsboro. Oh, that's a really great clip, and I'm gonna skip it because here's where you could go tonight. Queens County Museum, it's one of the two haunted locations uh, that Linda's gonna, group is gonna take you on a tour through. Of all the haunted shows I've seen, this is the most compelling piece of evidence to me of something weird that I have ever seen. And I didn't experience it, so I just see it. Now remember when I said Holly's a pretty even keel person. In my life, I have been in weird places with Holly. We have seen and experienced really weird stuff. I have never seen Holly drop dead, truly terrified, except for this. Um, Oh, sorry, next, next one. Oops, I don't even know what that is, but let's move along. There, here we go. I still don't know what this is. Holly, somewhere in the Inca Trail right now, she's thinking about this, doesn't know what this is. This is the office area of the, um, the archives area too. Linda Rafius' desk is right there, of the Queens County Museum. Holly, this is nothing. This is just Holly walking back into a room where Linda will tell you there have been reported paranormal activities. She would say the resident ghost. Um, we had had some stuff happen earlier in the evening, filing cabinets moving. Uh, I believe Holly said she had thought she had seen what was a shadow flitting in front of her, but nothing you'd pin your reputation on. It just so happened that we had a CCTV camera pointing in and Holly was being followed as she walked in by Chelsea, our sound person. Normally you wouldn't get audio on this, but it just so happened that's where they were. The only thing more terrifying than Holly's reaction is Chelsea's reaction, because this is one of the moments where Chelsea stopped being that lone holdout of skepticism. So let her rip, Greg. Holly, yeah. Chelsea's 23, I didn't know that was possible, but that was the only thing she could process. You gave me a hot flash. Um, I'm gonna play for you again. And you can hear Holly's just talking like, you know, go get Paul or whatever. Again, the film crew, we're trying to figure out what our next move is or something. From in front of her, you will, you'll hear a sound and you might not have been able to discern, you might have just assumed it was some one of us. You will hear as loud as you can hear, overarching her voice, oh. Holly said it was as if somebody was standing right in front of her and screamed at her. So she heard it herself and reacts by going, what was that? And if I played you the 20 minutes of footage we had after this, you'd see just how terrified Holly was, trying to process this in a logical way, and she couldn't. Right in front of her as if it's somebody sort of screamed or yelled at her. Chelsea could hear it through her... <laughs> 
her audio because Holly has a mic on, and she's like, what was that? Plus, you just blew my ears out with your yelling. Um, you gave me a hot flash. And so we went through the process of trying to determine what could this sound have been. Was it one of us? On Holly's initial thought was there's a walkie-talkie on the table in front of me. Three of us had walkies. There's just a random one sitting there. So she thought, okay, Paul or somebody else did something through the walkie, whatever. Turns out that walkie-talkie wasn't even on. So not the walkie-talkie, which was the only other, only possible explanation. So let's play it again. This time, listen for that sound. Oh, and then Holly will immediately react. Holly, yeah. Do you have those four? Oh, oh God. What? What? The, what? What was that? I don't know. What? And one more time, Greg. It'll. You can even. We put one of these things down. This bit here is the awe, which leads into Holly's reaction. So it still is ongoing, even as Holly begins to react to it. And also, if you can see it, um, watch Holly, too, jump back, like as if something has just sort of pushed her almost. Holly, yeah. Do you have those four? Oh, oh God. What, what? What? What was that? I don't know. What? 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 Gave me a hot flash. What? Oh my God. I don't know what that is, but it still freaks me out, and I guarantee you, it still freaks Holly out. So that's just some of the sort of evidence or experiences that we uh, discovered while shooting the first season of Haunting. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with us opening ourselves up, in my case, in a bad ways, in Holly's case, bad ways as well, in Dylan's case, in completely innocent ways, um, having it opened up for him. But eventually it came for all of us, or we were all in a place where, in this case, Chelsea, where something happened and she happened to be there when it happened. I think it can happen for all of you. I think if you go to any of these places that we visit and you open yourself up to the experience, and this would include the Queens County Museum tonight or Dexter's, who knows? Maybe somebody at the QCM is gonna go, whoa, to you too. Um, as long as I'm not there, you can be pretty sure it's not a demon. If I am there, not sure, but just remember, ghosts good, demons bad.